So it's the early 1980s, and that's the status of the thing. So instead of starting from Romer 86, let's start from Lucas. Partly because in some sense, Lucas' paper was written, well, it was written about the same time. One was a student at Chicago, the other was a professor at Chicago, they were talking to each other. Um, but the Lucas paper has more of a program in it, and in my view has been more influential. Um, so what is the Lucas, and, and I, I'll be frank, I think the Lucas paper has been influential in the wrong way. Uh, at the time, uh, I, I, I took it very seriously, but the more I grow, the more I think that while I think he meant well, it was a strange, uh, uh, a strange paper. What is, what is the point in, in, in Lucas? Come on, guys. The agreement was that you had to tell me things for an hour and a half. And but, so what is the point? Mm -hmm. You don't want to tell me what the point was. Bye. Please. What's the main point? So he starts from a bunch of empirical observations so to, speak, to motivate his thing, right? And what is the empirical observation he has in mind? Solar group model, which is in his paper, does not account for the infusion of spiders across countries in Asia. Right. Uh, very huge differences in factory utilizations, which are not there. Like the factor we observe of the differences in factors is reasons for of a factor of 10 and to account for differences in incomes, it should be 1,000. All right, so what is it he does? He says, look, there are rich countries that are poor countries. Disparities are enormous. And uh, They're there, and they've been persistent for many, many, many years. First caveat, yes, despite that enormous, they've been persistent for many, many years. Some have been persisting for hundreds, probably thousands of years. And I don't think we need Jerry Diamond or anything. There's tons of books of history documenting that. And so maybe the reason was a bit deeper than that. But that's okay. Huge disparities around the world. Still huge disparities. Then he says, well, we have a model of that. The model is a model of economic development and growth. So what is it then he does? He goes and picks what? The most stylized, restrictive, simplified model of growth, which in fact, as we have seen, and even in the words of its own creators, let's say solo cast equipments, if you want to restrict to that. And no intention, no purpose of describing any actual growth, right? So let's try to examine clinically what's going on here. From that point of view, there is, there is, there is, a, there is a strange marketing uh, game here, right? We take an extreme Mickey Mouse version of growth theory that has no intention to explain those facts and say it doesn't explain the facts. But there is nothing if I read Koopmans or if I read Solo or Cass that should lead me to think that that's what they're trying to do. That they're providing me with a model to think about why India is not growing in 1983, or China at the time is extremely poor, and instead United States and England and Japan are much richer. In fact, quite admittedly, if they are studying anything, say solo, which is the most explicit and the one that as we have seen, takes at least a policy debate as a departure, because you know, Kubmans is doing pure theory and is providing you with a simplified version of von Neumann, as you have seen. 
CAS is strictly trying to solve the theoretical problem. Do we have stability, right? And so the one that is actually talking directly, if you want, to, to, to policy issues is, is, is Solon. In that paper and in other papers. Funny, interestingly, and if you look at Solon, that literature, if you go on after 1956, that literature has actually contributed papers that provided slightly or even much more sophisticated models of growth that would allow for different patterns of growth. Okay, let's take Solo says, look, I'm talking about a policy issue in market economies. So what's the point of talking about India, which is not a market economy, it's not even a market economy now by, by standard thing, and it's growing. It's a lot more a market economy now than it was 35 years ago. 35 years ago, it was essentially an economy that still had plans, central planning, quinquennial plans, and all on. China was a completely socialist economy. So it's very interesting. I don't understand why Bob doesn't ask, why is Russia so poor? Well, we know why Russia is so poor, because they got a crazy fucked up market and political system. Why is Albania so poor? Why is North Korea so poor? I mean, for most of the so poor countries, at the time, there was a very straightforward forward answer. None of them is using even remotely anything that looks like free market and free initiative. No crazy super free man. No, no, no. Limited. It's Italian style. Half of the GMP is controlled by government. Okay. So no, no Hong Kong, no, no uh, libertarian uh, nightmare or paradise. You know, same, a little bit of market, a little bit of market. Not, not a lot. To me, that seems to be the very first answer. The second is if we look at Africa, well, maybe colonialism. Um, maybe the political structure, maybe the continuous civil wars, maybe the Western influence, maybe the game that Western, in this case, yes, multinational in some countries have played to destabilize and control the political environment to be able to extract resources. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe that's not the full explanation. I'm not sure the colonialism per se is a full explanation of the situation in African countries, honestly. But it's a starting point. If I have, you know, if I have to play Sherlock Holmes in the list of suspects, I'll start there. Maybe then I think at, say, Muslim country or former Ottoman Empire country, and I can see other reasons. I can see cultural reasons. I can see distribution of power, political system, also the way they got out of colonialism. Uh, <clears throat> no, for some reason, we decide to, and this starts a completely long deviation that has taken forms of people running regression with data across country, with 150 countries, looking at growth rate, ignoring completely if those countries were in a civil war, or oh, because it all washes out. No, there's no low large number at that level, not in that form, when half of your sample is in some form of political uh, collusion. You know, asking in 1983, why is Vietnam poor? It's not very hard, right? Well, being bombed for the last half of a century, so maybe, I guess that's the reason why Vietnam is so poor. Why is Cambodia poor? Well, you know, ever heard of Pol Pot? You know, where you wipe out a few million people out of the population. Well, Cambodia is probably 10 million or something. You know, maybe, maybe that country is not gonna do very well, right? And so on. So there is, you understand, I'm talking about the rhetoric of economics. I don't want to play Didra McCloskey too much. And I am a big admirer of Bob Lucas in many dimensions and many other contributions. But on this one, that paper is scary. Okay? And that's it. Because then the rest is trivial. Sure. A model built to show that you converge to a unique steady state is going to generate only that. <laughs> unique steady state, <laughs> right? When everybody become identical. If it is the same model everywhere, by the way, it's a model without international trade. Another element for another natural suspect could have been international trade. Maybe the Marxists are right. Maybe the system of international trade is a system of exploitation in which we extract natural resources from poor countries that we control militarily. And that's why they remain poor. By the way, 
Maybe not, and I don't believe that's at all the explanation. But again, if I play Sherlock Holmes, I'll go that way a bit because for some of those countries, for some countries, this is certainly be relevant. If you ask yourself, why are the banana republics what they are? Well, because they were banana republics. And I, you know, if I want to understand poverty in Guatemala or Costa Rica, uh, you know, the, the, the form of uh, col economic colonialism of the, coming from the United States certainly plays a role. It's not going to explain Brazil. It's not going to explain Argentina. Those are homemade, self-made disasters. But if you want to understand Panama and even part of Colombia and so on, that is so, right? So obviously, yeah, absolutely true. The cash coupon solo model is not meant to explain any difference. It's ex meant to explain only one thing. The fact that the market system with a capital accumulation investments on may actually not be completely unstable, may produce fairly stable outcome through uh, input substitution, period. End of the story. That's what it's meant to. And TFP is not meant to explain anything either, not only because of uh, me and the other solo that brought it uh, into place. We are very explicit. Say it's just a measure of ignorance. You know how TFP works. I don't need to. You guys know how to compute TFP? or solar zero, whatever you want to call it. Or in, in Europe, it's often called multi-factor productivity. In, in, in the United States, for some reason, it's called TFP in the sense of total factor productivity, whatever. But you know how to do it? Uh, should I give you an example? I, oh, by the way, this reminds me. We are the second week, and you haven't answered my question about the final leader. The clock is ticking. So if you want to do a little project, you better write me soon. Otherwise, we'll have to go with the technical question. Okay? So if you want, so one project could be go around and learn how to compute to TFP in different industries and sectors and countries and see, you know, <laughs> that it is in fact a measure of your ignorance and also of the data you use. If you get good data and you put in good data, like Zvit Grilich has did in his PhD thesis, uh, trying to explain growth productivity in agriculture, TFP becomes very small. If you just put in very rough measures of aggregate capital, aggregate labor, TFP becomes very big. It's the best indicator that Schumpeter was right. The most of what's going on is not that we accumulate more capital and structure, but that we have more people at work, but that we're doing things very differently. And that's not reflected in the number of hours work. That's not reflected even, you know, in the, in the factor share. Factor share reflected a bit, but all they can do, poor bastards, is to go between zero and one and move a bit, right? And so if I contemporaneously, I'm changing machines, type of machines, processes, methods, and workers, and so I'm changing both type of inputs. Maybe factor share don't really move that much, but I'm changing the ways I do things and I produce things very differently. And, and that's, that's what the point was. So there's no surprise that TFP is a bad measure because it's a measure of nothing. It's a measure of what I've not put in the regression or in the model or in the accounting exercise, if it is, right? So why should it be this way? By the way, make a note of this. We should go back to this. This idea of TFP treated as a, an actual process that has descriptive power as opposed to pure in accounting power. There is, there is a theory behind it of human action. That there is a theory of human interaction. That behind TFP, there is a, a theory of R&D, innovation, research. It's very misleading. I understand to be in a minority, but I'm actually, it's one of the things which I'm, I'm most sure of that, to be right. TFP is an accounting device and only an accounting device. The meaning of which changes dramatically according to the accounting rule you use and the data you use. Boom. And it is what Solo said. Just a measure of your ignorance in the sense of the measure of the quality of the data you're using in trying to explain productivity growth. Period. Theorizing about TFP, treating it, but to ask question. Oh, you know, if there is TFP, why is it that in Mexico they don't use the same technology they use in the Silicon Valley? Is frankly, and not so honest, you know, intellectually speaking, it's, it's, it's just a question one should not ask, right? And this is a question that the so-called no new growth theory has asked repeatedly in the late 80s and 90s. 
If technology is a blue book, if technology is available, why is it that in Zambia they don't do fashion design like in Milan? I don't know. It's 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 just not. It's just right. And inferring from that that the economic theory of growth and innovation doesn't make any sense seems to be. I don't know, not appropriate, let's say not appropriate, okay? So that's, that's the way, so it's, it's very strange that, that, you know, but from a question that has obviously no legitimate answer that will lead obviously to a very straightforward answer. If that's economic theory, then there is no answer, okay? Then you get to what? You get to this other view. So let's jump, let's forget the second part of Lucas' paper. And so we'll go back to that. But the answer comes, let's look at the 86 paper by Romer. If you notice, the 86 by, paper by Romer is noteworthy also for another thing. So you read it. I hope you read it because you must have, if you haven't read it, tell me and I'll kick you out of the class. <laughs> because, so the paper is actually not about technological progress. Right? So quite interesting, you know, if I have in mind the problem that Lucas poses, it's clear that the answer is, well, we need to understand the mechanics of technological progress. How it's a adopted from a country to another. If I'm thinking at, those are the years in which the USSR system collapses. And so in those years it becomes quite apparent that the key to the different level of productivity and standard of living between the two systems is really the incentive to innovate, right? In those years it becomes quite clear that the centrally planned economies have been not innovative at all. They've managed to catch up and copy on military technology in part, but as far as the rest is concerned, as far as the standard of living of normal cities is concerned, as far as, as, far as productivity is concerned, they haven't because there has not been technological change. Okay? So it becomes apparent in those years. It's, it's, you know, it will, many people have been claiming for years before, for decades, but at that point it's transparent. It's obvious, okay? So it's clear that you want to focus on that, right? But actually what Romer does is a different thing. What is that he does? What is that he proposes as a way of understanding the different patterns of growth between a country and another? No. 86. It's a paper that goes increasing returns and long run growth, right? Get it out. No, everybody. If you haven't read it, which sounds like you haven't read it, you better get it out and read it now. So, no, 9086. I send it to you guys. What's the theory? So we have this thing. We are, we are facing this conundrum, which is there's an enormous difference in growth rate, in standard of living, in well-being across countries in the world. Okay, the solo cast Kupmas model, which is not meant to study that, obviously says something that doesn't fit, which is, well, look, we're all converging to the same steady state. By the way, as an aside, the solo model, or if you want to call it the solo model, that model, as actually was actually incredibly well vindicated by the growing economies of the, at the time, market system, that we are all converging to very similar steady states. And the difference between levels between one and the other seem to be quite explainable by the different level of internal efficiency. So they were all growing, they all had slowed down in growing, they were all growing at some one, two, three percent a year, but at different levels, some relative, there would have been a certain amount of convergence, but then the convergence had stopped and, you know, United States kept being the most productive, Japan, Germany, England, France, Italy, and so on, within a range of 1 to 0.7, right? They were all there in the 1.7 interval at the time, and, and all somewhat growing in parallel at a relatively low rate after periods of high growth, which would be exactly what the simple model predict in an absence of international trade. 
obviously these were countries that they were trading so in order to understand them better one should have put trading and heterogeneity in the institutional system and so on i don't think one does a bad job in trying to understand the growth of the market economies between 1946 end of world war ii and 1990 end of the complete end of the uh, socialist system and real beginning of the arrival of india and china on the market economy is true china had started to change its way of doing things progressively during the 1980 90 decade but it's a small thing at the beginning you don't see it much so i think it's reasonable to look at data for at least 40 years say 1940 this is a project some i don't know if people have undertaken it but if you look at that period right that roughly 40 years 40 45 years, right 40 we can take Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods, I think, is 48, am I right? Right? And do 40 years, 48, 88, right? There is basically, world trade is almost all, if you take away oil and some uh, uh, raw materials, it's all within Canada, United States, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, that are small, Australia, very small, and Europe, Western Europe. Okay? It's there, I bet. I'm going to throw a number. If I take away raw material, that's probably 80% of international trade. Okay? And those economies start in 1948 and they're quite far apart. I mean, Italy is quite poorer than the United States. The United States is richer, blah, blah, blah. Some have been destroyed, some not, right? We observe some are very backward. Korea is very backward. Uh, Korea starts much later because they go through the war. Taiwan is very backward in terms of income per capita. And those economies, start trading, and if one starts to write down a decent model of trade, comparative advantages, and capital accu accumulation, uh, two-sector, three-sector uh, <clears throat> trade model, I bet that what those 30 countries, roughly 30, 35 countries did during that almost half century, it's not gonna be very far from what the model predicts. And it would be a legitimate question because the model is meant to give an abstract description of a world like that. Right? Relatively open market economy, uh, market mechanism, capital accumulation, relatively stable movement of information and, and science and innovation between one and the other. Right? And a more or less homogeneous political system without civil wars, without invasions, without disasters. Right? Um, all right, so that's, that's the world we have. Okay? So, Krumet's question is what? Read. You guys, you have to read the papers, I tell you to read. It's, the class is not going to work if you don't read the papers. Please don't do the same thing the class did last year. It's not going to be useful. I, I rather, if you, if you don't find the time, which you should find the time, you have a lot of days. Okay, it doesn't take more than two hours to read the uh, paper. Uh, then let's skip class because otherwise. Okay, so open up the paper. Come on, you haven't read it, so open it up. It's the one I sent you. <laughs> You're going to increase the return and longer growth. The Journal of Political Economy, Volume 94, Number 5, October 1986. Don't tell me you don't have that paper. Huh? Good. You provide the model, basically, where the production function allows to the introduction of a part of the knowledge. And the use knowledge is an explanation for endogenizing technology from different... Uh, and what All right, so there are... His the idea is that countries are different in the way they are accumulating uh, knowledge. And he explained... Uh, I mean, if you believe in this model, the way to explain the difference between countries is that Different choice in knowledge of no. No. no, not in this paper. So the paper starts out by saying, quoting Ramsey, Cass, and Koopmans. I don't know, it doesn't quote. Okay, so the 
Ramsey has very little to contribute. Ramsey just proposed, I don't know why people used to, Ramsey just proposed a utility function and uh, you know, it doesn't really, anyhow, people eventually ended up using a variation on Ramsey uh, objective function, which is the sum of discounted utility over an infinite horizon. Ramsey uses sum of undiscounted utility over a finite horizon to understand there was an optimal or, or to prove that there was a kind of blessing point in consumption. Okay, uh, but fine, it's okay. Uh, Ramsey was a fashionable and uh, smart guy, let's quote it. It says, oh, in these models, disturbances have no long run impact. Well, yes, as we see, those models are built to predict that. The, my, what else the point? The point is that in the absence of technological change, per capita output should converge to a steady state value with no per capita growth. Is this a statement about those models? If this is a statement only about those two specific models, yes, but they are built like that by assumption. If it is a statement about the class of model, it's a wrong statement because as we have seen, right? By the way, you, did you take a look to the Koopmans paper? Koopmans, the one on the concept of optimal economic growth, the one cited, the one Academia Scientifica, the Vatican Academy of Science, Pontificia Acad uh, Right. Okay, well, they're not so different. Let's look at that, uh, that one too. So that's the QJ 9064? Yeah. Right. What is that he does in that paper? He starts from the work of von Neumann and uh, he tried to build, uh, to explain and build uh, this production set uh, to Basically, he explains very beautifully for Neumann, right? What's the property of that paper, of the model study in that paper? I mean, he provides uh, dramatically the, uh, yeah. how the production set is uh, and the piece of growth found in the... Yeah, there's all the example. You like, I love the one with the rabbit, right? <laughs> and humans, yeah. It, it explains why, you know, growth is always bounded by the growth, the internal reproduction rate of the least growing essential factor. You know, it explains slowdown, right? Uh, good. The point is that it's a, go, it's a model of unbounded growth, right? In fact, it's a model of unbounded growth that is extremely simple to use to get very different growth rates. Take two countries, Take the, take the rabbit example and just take two countries with different technologies, different incentives. One has humans of type A, the other is do do humans of type B. And they just grow along to different very balanced growth. Correct? In absence of trade, so I want to understand Russia that doesn't trade with the USA and doesn't grow. Not so difficult. Right? So what I'm trying to say is there is a selection filter in what we cite and what we give as understood, which is quite amazing. This is Koopmans. This is not some unknown guy. I'm citing Koopmans in the paper, but why do I cite? Right? You see what I mean? And by the way, in the article for, in the, if I recall it correctly, I'm trying to find it in my files and uh, I must have put it somewhere else because I used to have that as well. In fact, I'm pretty sure I have it because I always give it to my students. Um, the, the very long one, the QJ1 is short, right? The very long one that, that Romer, A. Romer, that Kuhlmanns wrote for the Pontificia Academia, uh, I think also contains an explanation of the, of the Kuhlmanns model. Sorry, of the von Neumann model. Let me, let me try to find it. Uh, 